without further ado then thank you so much everybody for joining us in this next session of i use ethics values and technology series we've covered a lot of ground um already throughout this series well, professor up at purdue the ethics with the government hacker that was a great uh, great presentation and great discussion um, you might remember just last week, we were able to feature Amanda Craig uh, from Microsoft talking to us about, you know, cyber norms. Val from the Cyber Future Society talking similarly about the future of uh, cyber peace. A lot of wonderful ground. Today, we're focusing more on another core aspect of this series, and that is not only cyber um, ethics, but now cybersecurity and the intersection in particular with uh, geopolitics and national security. And we're thrilled to be able to do that. Uh, with two leading researchers affiliated with Harvard's uh, Belfer Center, and they are Simon Jones. Good to see you, Simon. Um, he is a technology and, and security professional. He's currently serving as the Director of Information Security and Compliance for a Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. Simon's also a non-resident fellow with Belfer's Defending Digital Democracy Project. Um, and has been very involved in the uh, Cyber Power Index, which is the new report uh, that we'll be featuring today. And then uh, we're also very lucky to be joined by um, Anina uh, Schwarzenbach, because she's a criminologist and postdoctoral associate at the University of Maryland Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice, and a fellow uh, with Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center as well. Um, and her work focuses on political violence. Uh, that was actually the topic of our research series right before this, so um, tis the season, uh, and government responses, cyber powers and threats, policing, state legitimacy. I um, mean, she's been a member of Belfer's cyber project team that has built the cyber power index that was just recently released last month. I um, mean, has also been the international security program postdoctoral fellow. So in other words, uh, we have two very accomplished um, cybersecurity thought leaders with us, and we're, we're thrilled to have you both. Um, and very excited uh, to hear about this report, your thoughts, and allow us to, uh, to dig in, because there have been a few attempts over the years to gauge, to define first and then gauge uh, cyber power around the world. And this, I think, is a really, uh, really compelling example about how to do that effectively. So um, thank you so much again uh, for taking the time to join us today. Um, and if, if you're good to go on your end, I'm happy to pass the baton. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> Look, thank you for inviting us. Really excited to be here. Uh, let me share my screen and let's see if you can see this. Um, okay. If you perfect. Can see perfect. All right, great. Well, look, thank you again for having us. I really appreciate it. So, um, the National Cyber Power um, Index was, um, you know, a product of uh, about a year's worth of research. And um, really it started when we started to look at the, the kind of key question around, you know, what is cyber power? We saw a lot of people talking about cyber power um, and there seemed to be a kind of lack of consistency and lack of clarity about what actually cyber power amounted to and quantitative and qualitative ways to really assess cyber power. So Anina and I, along with a, a team of fantastic uh, co-authors, Julia Irfan, Winona and Dan, came together uh, through the Belfer Center to really start to kind of wade into this and, and, and discuss uh, the topic and, and try and bring some of that kind of rigor and focus to the, to the topic. So you all will have seen these kind of quotes, you know, which countries are cyber superpowers. Uh, you will have seen perhaps the same list of countries, you know, US, China, Russia, Israel, UK. And again, not that we were trying to sort of critique or criticize our, our predecessors and those who tried to do it before, but we were struck very much by the observation that um, there was too much of a kind of focus on very eye-catching cyber attacks or perhaps countries that talked a lot about cyber attacks and, and cyber capabilities. And we were worried that actually countries might be missed by this, this approach. And so that's why we tried to inject this kind of rigor and, and methodology to it. So in, in, in essence, you know, the kind of traditional interpretation of cyber power or, you know, what predecessors have typically tended to focus on um, has been predominantly capability focused, you know, again, those kind of eye catching attacks and again, offensive cyber capabilities as well. And um, we really felt that that was not necessarily the right approach. And, you know, many of you will have seen the capability intent opportunity triangle, you know, it's used a lot in counterterrorism, it's used a lot in cyber uh, threat assessments. 
And, and we, really, we really start to think that perhaps that intent element and to a slightly lesser extent that opportunity element was really missing from, from that interpretation and really missing from that analysis. And so that was one of the kind of key things we tried to focus on. You know, what are these cyber powers trying to achieve and, and how do they really bring that capability to bear to, to achieve it? And we were very aware that a lot of people talked about cyber in, um, you know, in terms of conventional power, conventional military power, nuclear power, um, intelligence agency competition and things like that. And, you know, we really start to feel that actually, whilst there is some sort of, you know, analogous focus, um, you know, the, 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 that, that analogy doesn't particularly carry across because countries are using cyber in a very kind of distinct way. And really I'll use kind of two analogies of the, the conventional military power to kind of show you some examples of this. You know, again, if you're only looking through the lens of capability and if you're only looking through the lens of offensive capability, well, how can you make sure that actually you are addressing the, the right threats and, and the country has the tools to achieve its goals, you know, and, and from a kind of conventional military perspective, well, you could count all the tanks a country has, but if it has a large coastline, maybe it needs a Navy. Um, and likewise, you know, if you are measuring only tanks and troops when you're counting kind of conventional military uh, capability, you are not necessarily capturing the full picture of what a country does to defend itself and also to give itself the tools to conduct uh, espionage and things over overseas and, and elsewhere. So again, you know, we, we started to kind of think about this and think about what did that mean in analogy terms and actually how were countries using cyber power? So the conclusion we, draw, we drew was that cyber power is a mixture of intent and capability. Um, it is the intent of a country to pursue national objectives using cyber means. And it is the demonstration that it has the capabilities to achieve those, those objectives. And so really focusing on those kind of two elements we thought was, a, was, was, was really kind of trying to approach this from a very fresh and novel perspective. And, you know, the underlying subtext of this was that cyber is a tool in the toolkit of countries. Um, you know, it sits alongside, as I said, conventional military power, it sits alongside diplomacy, economic levers, and other things that have, has avail, available to a country. But it is just one tool it uses to achieve its goals. You know, cyber objectives themselves may be unique, but what they are trying to achieve with them are not necessarily unique. And so we work to find eight different objectives that countries are looking to pursue through cyber means. And we assessed seven of these in the research, um, or we, we measured seven of them in the index, surveilling, monitoring domestic groups, enhancing national cyber defenses, defining international cyber norms and technical standards, foreign intelligence collection, destroying and disabling an adversary's infrastructure, growing national cyber and technical competence and controlling and manipulating the information environment. So we assess those both in, 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 in intent terms and in capability terms in the research. But there was an eighth one that we found that we struggled to uh, assess, particularly from a capability side, which is amassing wealth and extracting cryptocurrency. And we hit across these eight objectives based on a very comprehensive literature review. Uh, we looked at probably around 100 cyber national cyber strategies you know across across a number of years a number of iterations that countries published them we assessed about a thousand government cyber websites or web pages uh, we looked a lot of uh, private sector and, and kind of uh, independent uh, attribution of cyber attacks again really to try and focus on what was that country trying to achieve and and how did it use cyber to achieve that objective and, and again we really felt that that was a kind of key part of this because that then allowed us to say, okay, this is the intent and this is what the country is trying to achieve. Now we can then focus on measuring um, the, the capability it brings to bear to, to achieve that. And, and really we think this, this brings kind of three big benefits to policymakers, you know, because many of us, um, if I had all of us have some kind of policy background or, or national uh, government background, you know, really it helps to broaden the assessment of cyber power, you know, it makes it much more comprehensive. It breaks us out from the kind of defense offense view of cyber power. Uh, secondly, you know, we think it's a useful tool for starting to look at cyber through the lens of cyber priorities and, and policy objectives. And, and again, you know, why is someone deciding to invest in cyber capabilities versus, you know, their diplomatic core or their conventional military um, uh, uh, forces? And then, and then finally, you know, we think this is a year on year tool that you can really use to kind of measure and monitor uh, different countries. You know, by looking iteratively what countries are doing and how they're expressing their intent and whether or not they have the capability to do this, 
we thought this was something that we could be building across a number of different years and a number of different iterations of the NCPI. And that would give policymakers a really good insight into the, the international cyber power landscape. So I'll hand over to Anina to talk you through a bit more of the kind of detail of how we got here. Yes, uh, so I will dive into the way the cyber power was measured and combined together and walk you through uh, some of the main results on both like the general aggregated levels. So that means uh, the levels of the cyber power index and then also look at the capabilities and intent. But uh, first uh, things first, let's start uh, with how we constructed cyber power. Uh, to do this, uh, as Simon mentioned, we have done like a literature review. We have also looked theoretically how how power is defined, national power, and have taken kind of inspiration from there and, and thus came up with this definition of cyber power as a combination of capability and intent. And the way this formula reads, it, it, it's as you see, it's a sum uh, of capabilities and intent for each of the objectives uh, that, uh, yeah, that Simon mentioned before. And then we take the, uh, the average sum of, uh, of the score for each of those objectives and we come up uh, with this, uh, with the final ranking of cyber power. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, can I... uh, so the question is, uh, after you know we have our formula our definition we have uh, our idea now uh, how how does a country demonstrate intent and what are its capabilities so basically how do we measure these two aspects that are like the core uh, of uh, of our of our measure of cyber power next slide please And I will start uh, by measure, measuring intent. And what you see here uh, is not to kind of <laughs> afraid uh, or not to scare the audience, but it's just like a, a snapshot basically of, uh, of our grid uh, we used uh, to measure intent. So uh, just to kind of show you that we had like, uh, uh, we, we have like, um, Came up with a clear grid uh, informed by, by, by the by the work uh, mainly Simon and uh, and other colleagues have done uh, and ha have come up with this grid that then we we assess in ways I will show you now. Next slide, please. So basically, uh, what we have done is uh, an analysis of, of cyber strategies uh, mainly, and we have asked different questions. Uh, and these questions are reported in this grid uh, that you see, uh, have you, that you have seen before. And uh, if somebody wants to kind of have a closer look at all of this work, we have uh, also a report that is published uh, via the Belfer Center. Uh, so I encourage you to look that up in case or a question at the end. Uh, so, but basically just to have like a more kind of a general idea how this was done is uh, we have, for instance, asked how comprehensive is the country's cyber strategy? Does it include specific actions, owners and objectives. We have asked how long has the country had a cyber strategy for? How regu regularly has the country updated its cyber strategy? How recently has the country updated its, its strategy? And has the country announced increased cyber funding since uh, it last published its strategies? And then we assess this through binary or like more granular indicators. And then uh, this kind of was fed into a score at the, at the end. But so we, we had like this clear kind of questions in mind that we have then, uh, and, and we walked through each of this, uh, of the strategy by looking at these questions. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, just to have like a, a specific uh, snapshot, I thought it would be maybe good to look at one of our objectives. So this is the example for surveillance, how we kind of scored uh, the intent factors for surveillance. So, uh, because uh, why I'm presenting this is because for each, uh, since we had these uh, different uh, objectives, so for each objectives, we carefully looked at whether uh, we could find kind of a notion uh, where, where this objective was addressed in the, in the cyber strategies, and if so, to which extent. 
uh, for instance. So this is then the, like the more specific questions for each of the objectives that for survey so for surveillance would be, for instance, does the country have at least one policy or law enforcement agency with, uh, with specialist cybercrime expertise or that en encourages citizens to report cybercrime? Uh, I pick another one. Uh, is cybercrime, cyberterrorism, terrorism or domestic surveillance via cyber means referred to within the country's domestic counterterrorism or homeland security strategy plan or law? And then the, the ones I mentioned before, the consistency of the objective uh, uh, and so on. So you see uh, kind of basically a snapshot of, of the grid I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, next one, please. So kind of to wrap up the methodology for, for the intent part of our index, uh, it was based uh, mainly on a textual analysis uh, of uh, each country's cyber strategy. Uh, and we uh, have uh, as, uh, we have then validated these findings also through the national language processing part. Uh, this Simon has done a lot of work on this, so I'm sure maybe he he will then like add some some insights on what I'm saying now. But I'm just giving you a broader overview. And but feel free to have to kind of post questions now or also at the end. Uh, and the, then like kind of this, this intent part is made up of 32 indicators, which are grouped under the seven national objectives uh, that we mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So surveillance, defense, control, intelligence, commerce, offense, and norms. Uh, and what is uh, what we have done? So we have like looked at the demonstrated intent uh, based on, on the strategies, but also the other part we have looked to have uh, looked uh, whether, um, yeah, uh, the stated intent, sorry, but we have also looked at, at the demonstrated intent, for instance, we're looking uh, at, at cyber attacks that were carried out. So this was also um, information that we included in intent index. Uh, and the county's overall rating is the average of the seven national objectives converted to a scale of zero to 100%. Next one. So this was for the intent part, now let's move on for the capabilities and this is kind of structured in a similar way just to show you uh, how we have proceeded. This is a snapshot of uh, the capability kind of matrix. And again, uh, you will find much more detail uh, information uh, on this in our report uh, in case uh, you, you would be interesting, interested in it. So, uh, this is kind of gives you a list of the indicators mapped to the different objectives. And now I will walk you through this measure. Uh, next. Now the themes we have addressed here, here is, um, we have also looked at the attacks with a slightly different measure though. Uh, we have looked uh, at national online content. We have content, we have looked at domestic state, state cyber structures. At, uh, at also, we have looked at cyber vulnerabilities, at private sector trade and innovation measures, at connectivity measures, measures that assess workforce and legal and policy frameworks. And uh, next. And now um, these kind of themes then translate in specific indicators and I'm just mentioning a few, so there was a a long list also for the capability indicators. It's for instance, military cyber capabilities, cyber defense capabilities, cyber surveillance, human capacity, um, domestic policy, technical standards, and so on, the list goes on. Uh, next, please. Now the methodology for the capability part was uh, different from, from the intent part, but because we have seen the intent uh, was really heavily based uh, on on this assessment of the cyber strategies together with, with the assessment of the demonstrated intent. Uh, whereas the capability uh, part uh, was uh, relying uh, on, on the set of indicators and we have uh, in, in the map that I've shown you in the Snapchat, basically we have mapped uh, these indicators to specific objectives. Uh, and, and these indicators are, are all indicators we have uh, collected uh, through um, either um, open source information or some of the indicators we have also sourced them uh, in-house uh, because uh, they were may maybe more specific or missing. missing. Uh, 
missing for now. So, so kind of we have done this work as well. Uh, and the way then this kind of, uh, that kind of very more <laughs> boring methodological part of this was done. So we have indicators that are on different scales and measure different objectives. And then we have, uh, first of all, uh, broke them on, on the same scale through um, mean max normalization technique. So, so that then every indicator we, we now consider ranges from zero, which uh, means very low capability. Uh, to also 100%, which means very high capability. Uh, now there are other techniques uh, out there one could use with other pros and cons. So there's a lot of, you know, also methodological work behind that. Uh, but then uh, once we had like all these indicators on the same scale, we have then aggregated them together for pair kind of uh, objective. Uh, and this is maybe remembering the formula I showed you also at the beginning, and then we have taken uh, the average across the seven objectives. And just as a side note, so some indicators uh, we have in our uh, data set are important for multiple objectives. So therefore they are counted multiple times. Uh, and now next one, please. And now to the kind of more interesting part. <laughs> to their results. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is a snapshot uh, again of the uh, national cyber power score. So this is kind of, this is the result of all this work of kind of assessing and collecting information on intent and on capability uh, and mapping them to the objectives and then like uh, multiplying them together and averaging. And then we end up with the score. Uh, that range uh, ranges from zero, which would be very low cyber power, to a hundred, which would be very high cyber power. Uh, now, you remember this is kind of uh, it's a result of a multiplication, and so therefore, with this idea that cyber mentioned, also like with this idea that capabilities al alone uh, don't kind of uh, are not enough for for being a cyber power. It, we need to have the intent to really also leverage those capabilities. Uh, so therefore, if the intent is low, then kind of the capability scores shrinks. Uh, this is the basic kind of idea behind, behind what we are seeing here. Uh, and the results are that, uh, uh, next slide. Uh, or yeah, or it's also basically the main results of what you see uh, summarized in this table. Uh, and this table is interesting for a couple of reasons. For, first of all, it shows you on, uh, you know, on, uh, on, on the column overall score, you have uh, you have the result uh, of, of our cyber power index. So it is basically uh, translated into score what you've seen in the graph before. But you also have a column uh, capabilities and a column intent. Uh, and this shows you the ranking uh, based uh, on, on only like the capability index and only the intent index. So meaning that we have with our measure, we have provided one an overall score of cyber power, but we have also provided two additional measures, one uh, looking at cyber capability and one looking at the intent uh, and therefore allowing uh, countries also kind of to nav navigate the strength and weaknesses in both of these domains. Uh, and so the results show you uh, the first 10, like the top 10 uh, cyber powers according to our measure and our index uh, result to be for the year 2020 will result to be United States, China, the UK, Russia, Netherlands, France, Germany, Canada, Japan, and Australia. But I want to draw your attention, for instance, if we pick uh, Australia, which is number 10 overall, you see the capability, uh, Australia ranks pretty low, whereas intent, uh, it's much higher up up. So this kind of gives you a, a, an indication, as I said before, where kind of one would might want to look at and one would might want to build uh, uh, strength. Uh, and this is in line with, with uh, what Simon also have, has mentioned, that we really wanted to provide a measure that is also useful uh, both for practitioners that, uh, that want to have like more specific information and, and also, but also for researchers they want to dig into this aspect uh, in more detail. So we are really careful. We were very, it was very important to us that we provide a measure that allows a, a high level of disaggregation. 
Next one. Uh, and this uh, is uh, the graph showing the ranking by intent. So as I, this is kind of basically now moving back to, to the visualization of the results is, is kind of what we have seen uh, just in the table before, but extended to all of the countries in our data set. Uh, and you see uh, here uh, all the countries and, uh, and, and the, the score for intent. And it's uh, scored, and you see also that it's um, uh, split up by, by the different objectives. So uh, they, they are listed uh, in the legend on the right. Uh, and what is interesting here is just also to see at what point some objectives are more or less important for, for specific country. So this is just like a first hint uh, uh, yeah, to, to then uh, carry out uh, further analysis, basically. Next. And this is uh, the ranking, if we now look uh, at the ranking by intent for the specific objectives, uh, here we have the top 10 listed for, for the objectives that by now <laughs> uh, we know. So like, uh, as I mentioned, surveillance, defense, control, intelligence, commercial, offense, and norms. Um, and you see um, how you see how much variation there, there is uh, for most of the countries uh, uh, when, where they, they are kind of ranked in the different objectives. That also tells you basically that combining all of that, uh, all of these different objectives in, in one measure, by doing that, you, you lose a lot of information. So it's very important and interesting to have at hand a measure whereby you, you can look uh, you, you can look really where the strength of the countries are um, in these specific objectives. Next. Uh, we move now uh, on to the capability side of the story. Uh, and here is the, the final uh, capability score. So combining all the seven objectives for, for the country we have assessed. Uh, and you see that the uh, if you have a, a closer look, you, you will see that uh, although the top uh, 10 are more or less stable, uh, you still see that there are some, some jumps in the country. If, if you then like assess, uh, assess capability together with intent, this ranking changes basically. Next. Uh, and uh, you see also here, this is also just to show you how kind of consistent we were in our assessment and our methodology. We have here the ranking uh, by capability, uh, the top 10 along the seven objectives. Uh, and yeah, differently from before, now we look at capability and not intent. But the same idea behind uh, is true also here that we, we provided a measure where, whereby you really can assess these different capabilities together uh, with the same uh, strength. I think, as I mentioned before, that like just combining uh, all of that together, you, you kind of will lose uh, that this variation in the rankings across the countries. Next. I want to kind of uh, wrap up this part by um, focusing quickly on the capability side and on, on two spotlights uh, that I want to mention. So first, uh, uh, if you look at national cyber defense, it's not like, not, not here in this, uh, in this presentation, but if you will look at the report, you will see uh, that a lot of countries rank quite highly. Uh, so there is also the question kind of how we came up with this score, what kind of, um, what underlies all of uh, all of these objectives in, in specific uh, looking at specific indicators and so i just kind of want to give you a bit of a, um, a hint how this was done so for cyber uh, national cyber defense we had uh, 10 in indicators and among others there were cyber security laws top cyber security firms computer and mobile infection rates vulnerabilities uh, cyber security response team mobile and broadband speed and some of those are positively related to, to the capabilities of national cyber defense and others are negatively related. Uh, so this is kind of how they were, uh, were uh, included in our index. Uh, and I think this kind of list shows you, <clears throat> yeah, shows you that the, a bit the duality and it becomes even more evident if you look at specific countries. So 
The USA, uh, for instance, ranks very high on vulnerabilities affecting domestic machines, uh, which is kind of included negatively in the index as well as on top cybersecurity firms, which is positive. So you see that there, there is kind of, it, it levels out uh, a bit to a certain point uh, because you have both these positive and negative uh, indicators. Next one. Uh, and then uh, spotlight Israel, maybe then Simon wants to expand on that at, at the end as well. I think I just also want to mention this because it's a question we, we get a lot. Um, so you, you might have missed uh, like Israel from the top 10 uh, cyber powers in, in the ranking I've presented at the very beginning. Uh, and this is, uh, if, if you have missed it, it's true because it's not in the top 10, it's ranked 14, number 14 for the National Cyber Power Index 2020. Uh, and uh, it's ranked, if you look at, uh, at the, cap the capabilities that are mostly kind of connected, that are generally kind of uh, connected with cyber power or, or the offense part that are usually like discussed together uh, out uh, uh, in the literature, uh, you will see that there Israel is uh, ranked number 12. Uh, now this is kind of uh, in uh, lower uh, as some expert would have assessed it. And I just kind of want to give like a, a couple of um, explanation of why uh, this is the case. Uh, and then we might want to discuss this further on uh, in, in the discussion section. <clears throat> so first of all, uh, since we have provided this measure that is so disaggregated, we can look at what kind of indicators went uh, in, in this assessment uh, of Israel. So you have the cyber command uh, indicator where Israel is not like ranked at, uh, the highest. Uh, so because it's, um, there are more kind of sophisticated cyber commands. We have the high tech exports where also other countries are ranked higher than Israel. The military staffing where other countries uh, have uh, a larger uh, number of staffing than, than Israel. So this is kind of how can this indicator came to be together. Uh, obviously, the there are also shortcomings which uh, Simon will address later on as well, more generally. <clears throat> but you see those in this indicator. We, we have based uh, our index on open source data for specific reasons. Um, but this has obviously also some limitations. So, Therefore, we kind of as uh, we consider more quantitative than qualitative aspects for this um, capability assessment specifically. This is kind of less uh, true for the intent part. But uh, next one, please. And I kind of want to finish uh, by showing you this map. Uh, and this is another way uh, how we can look at our index or how others can and have looked at our index and how kind of uh, the usefulness of it is, I think is depicted a bit in, in, in this graph because what this graph shows you is on the X axis, we have the cyber capability index and on the epsilon, the cyber intent, and they are mapped uh, one against each other. So we, we end up uh, with four quadrants uh, with very, on the, on the left uh, high up corner, we have lower capability and higher intent. Uh, and we have kind of a cluster of countries that fall uh, in, in, into this um, basket, basically. So we have uh, Russia, Netherlands, Canada, Israel, uh, Australia, and, and so on, uh, on this part. Then on the, uh, on, on the upper level, but on the, on the right part of, of the quadrant, you, you will see kind of uh, the country that have both uh, high capabilities, but also high uh, intent. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the US, China, the UK, France, uh, and Germany. Uh, and this is kind of very interesting to see where they are positioned in this map. And then we have uh, uh, the largest part of, 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 uh, of the countries we have assessed that fall into lower capabilities and lower intent. Although you, you see with this map, there is variation across the countries. So, some you would see that there is kind of a move toward the middle ground or a move toward uh, the, the higher quadrants. Uh, so uh, therefore uh, it's very likely that in our next assessment, this kind of map will change a bit. And on the, on the 
lower level uh, on the right hand, you have the higher capability and lower intent. And this is uh, true for, few, for very few countries kind of having this uh, combination together. So uh, we only have um, South Korea and Singapore kind of, uh, and others that maybe touch it a bit, but um, yes. So this is kind of another way how we can, um, how we can look at our index and uh, Another way that I think uh, helps also to understand uh, the, the work we, we have done and kind of the usefulness of it uh, as well. So I will now hand it over again to Simon to finish up. Great, thank you, Nina. So, I mean, uh, Anina touched on a lot of this, but you know, we are very aware of the limitations of doing this. Um, but we still felt it was a useful exercise to do because we felt it was a good way to be, you know, as we, as we said, kind of challenging some of that kind of conventional thinking around cyber and to try and, you know, make this a very data led exercise. Um, but although we cherry picked the 30 countries, you know, we selected the 30 countries we felt um, should be included on this list. It was difficult to select data, find data that was consistent across all 30 countries. Um, for that matter, I mean, really, we were able to find common indicators across 29 countries, the exception being DPRK. Um, and that was, you know, we thought that was that was an appropriate and, and acceptable approach. And we used some um, expert analysis to kind of help us score DPRK. Um, but it did mean that, you know, some very interesting data sets we had used that we felt would have been very insightful. Uh, perhaps we couldn't use um, because they just weren't common across all 29 of the remaining countries. Um, we're also aware that, you know, na national cyber power is just one way that countries, um, you know, are competitive in cyberspace. Um, we do know countries use proxies, we, we, they use hackers for hire, they use, you know, national groups within their borders. Again, we just wanted that golden thread all the way from the kind of national um, domestic and foreign policy through to a cyber objective, through to how the country itself tries to employ, employ that cyber uh, effect or capability. But we do realize, you know, this does narrow and preclude us from seeing some of the activity countries do um, do still, you know, undertake in, in cyberspace. Um, as Nina mentioned, you know, we know there are some simplifications, you know, again, some of those metrics were used, you know, we know they are, they are good, but they're not necessarily excellent uh, indicators of, you know, some of our objectives and some of the capabilities we're measuring um, and, and so that is we're, we're very aware is, is a, you know something we'd look to challenge and think about in future iterations of the NCPI and, and finally you know we're very aware that we are capturing the duality of cyber capabilities I mean you know as, as Nina demonstrated there very well you know some capabilities that in one objective is a positive indicator and another one is a negative indicator for example social media use um, and you know, again, that does mean that there is a risk that, you know, using one of those common data sets um, does inject, you know, kind of greater risk that was skewing our results or, or sort of not giving them, you know, the kind of fair analysis we, we, we were expecting to, to focus on. Um, but just kind of find a slide and as a wrap up, I mean, again, we really want this to be useful for policymakers. And so our approach is basically recommending a kind of four step approach for policymakers. You know, how do you break out from the current very stovepiped view of cyber, you know, how do you try and challenge and, and kind of take a more comprehensive approach? And, and really, the first stage is break beyond, you know, cyber offense and defense, attack and defense. You know, that is not how most countries are seeing cyber capability or how they're employing cyber capability. So we really want them to try and think about that and actually stop thinking about that kind of that, that just in offense and defense terms, because it is so much more comprehensive and actually there's a risk that countries you know, self-deter themselves if they are thinking in those terms. And, and secondly, thinking about the priorities of other countries. You know, again, we, we throw up some really interesting results about how there is a lot of competition between um, the US, China, Russia um, on things like controlling the information space. And, you know, in the midst of an election campaign and, and a combination of election campaign, you know, we are seeing that manifest. So understanding the priorities and objectives of other countries, both allies and adversaries, is, is an important thing that this research shows and it should be something that countries are factoring in. And then thirdly, you know, developing a comprehensive cyber vision. We, we saw a lot of strategies that were very well written, you know, very comprehensive, but they only covered one aspect of a country's cyber policy and their Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs would have one document and then their you know, Department of the Prime Minister or President would have another and their Ministry of Defence would have another. 
you know, really we're recommending you, you produce common and consistent policy across all of these different organizations that really try and capture and consolidate all these different cyber policies and strategies into, into a single document that the entire uh, system of government buys into. And then finally, put money in the right places. And, and again, it's not about spending more money, but it's about thinking more strategically about cyber. Oh, we might have lost you, Simon. Can you still hear us okay? Could be a dramatic pause, but there might be a connection issue. Yeah, there is a connection <laughs> Indeed. I think I knew where he was headed, though. Oh, no, you're back, Simon. Oh, did you lose me? We did just for uh, maybe just the last 30 seconds. Okay, great. So like I said, put money in the right places, you know, spend, spend money smarter. It doesn't necessarily mean more. That's the final conclusion at that point. Um, so that's the conclusion of our presentation. We'd be delighted to take any questions and, and comments you have. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And um, I know everyone is joining me in a virtual round of applause because <laughs> it's very much a tour de force. These, these projects are notoriously difficult. So frankly, I applaud you for just taking it on in the first place um, as well. I, I, did, I did have a few questions myself, but just as a reminder to the attendees and the students in particular, feel free to use the Q&A feature to pose your own questions. Um, to, uh, to Simon and Anina, and uh, we will get to those um, as well. It looks like we do have, oh good. Let's, let's start with those from the box. I, 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 I'm happy to, to pose mine as well, but I wanna make sure we get to those from the audience first. Um, so one of the questions you guys can see it as well is, um, how is the commerce objective defined or what are the indicators of commerce? Um, did the indicators show true you know, for all 30 countries? And what about supply chain partnerships? Do they play a role in this area? So maybe that's in reference to some tighter supply chains, perhaps across NATO, et cetera. So there, there's kind of a series of questions there, uh, but feel free to respond to any of those that you guys would like. Sure, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start and then Anina can jump in. So yeah, I mean, with the, all of the objectives we outlined had both kind of offensive um, components and you know defensive if you're thinking in that kind of offense defense line so the commerce objective was both um, everything from uh, commercial espionage so you know thinking about some perhaps Chinese activity stealing f-35 plans and you know kind of commercial IP but it was also building your cyber export industry as well you know building your ability to sell cyber products elsewhere and kind of creating you know, so you know that's that that's sort of burgeoning cyber economy uh, within your own country so we, we and and for all of these you know we try to avoid any kind of uh, pejorative label with the objective you know information control likewise is both everything from spreading propaganda and misinformation through to tackling propaganda and boosting privacy. So we did try and make it so, you know, countries shouldn't feel labeled by, by achieving or pursuing one or more of these objectives. And, and to the question around supply chains, I mean, yeah, we, we saw this as a kind of key part of that. And, and that was one of the indicators we did look for, you know, were countries trying to protect their own cyber supply chain and, you know, think about who their suppliers were and recommend, um, you know, ways that the industries could protect themselves as part of the commercial objective. Anything you wanted to add, Anita, or are you? Uh, no, it's yeah. kind of, uh, yeah, I'm just like kind of reiterating a bit. So we looked um, on the capability side, we mm -hmm. just thinking about kind of standard indicators also you would use to, to measure uh, commerce. So we looked, for instance, at, uh, at uh, human capital, um, and, but we looked also at the tech exports, we looked at patent mm -hmm. application and so, and a number of more, uh, so it's kind of hard to remember all of those. But in in uh, sure. in our report today, I, I, by the way, I've just like posted the link, uh, so there is like uh, all the detailed information on the post. Thank you. No, I should have done that at the beginning. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, and uh, Jane was also asking about measuring national uh, vulnerabilities, and uh, she kind of references in particular their concerns around. Um, uh, numbers, types of devices, so perhaps, you know, IoT vulnerabilities, and as you mentioned, maybe the applicable laws and policies could have some impact on that if there's, you know, more 
robust standards for reasonable cybersecurity for internet connected devices, et cetera. Um, did you guys take into account those types of issues? Those are also quite tough, I know. Yeah, we, we used uh, we used Showdown data. The only kind of proprietary data set we used was, was Showdown data. Uh, we only took a relatively small snapshot, you know, again, to make sure we could find the same devices across the same countries. But we looked at things like, um, you know, heart bleed vulnerabilities. We looked at different types of kind of web infrastructure and, you know, the, the, the quality, the, the quantity in a country, you know, how well it was supported, you know, so if people are still using XP machines, you know, they, they scored down the, these kind of things. So we did start to try and look about those kind of vulnerabilities and what could be assessed through through those kind of approaches. Yeah, so that was one area. And I'd like, you know, certainly in future iterations, using that kind of more comprehensively would be would be good. Um, uh, Nina, do you recall what else we used in terms of other kind of metrics? Um, no, so that was kind of the, the, the principal metrics on that side. We, we looked also at, uh, you know, um, content removal requests. Uh, from mm -hmm. from Google uh, and so this was another metric we, we have assessed these are uh, by the way these are these are kind of the less traditional measures we have used and I think this is also very interesting and important because once kind of you start to look uh, at uh, you know at trying to define first of all but also then trying to measure you you cannot only really rely on, on kind of the traditional ones but you have to come up with more creative uh, ways so these are kind of the more creative ways uh, uh, yeah, we have come up with this measure, meaning, uh, although also kind of there is always a limitation coming with that as well, that we will need future iterations and assessment to kind of uh, uh, to improve the measurements basically as well. So, oh, absolutely. No, it's, it's an ongoing process, that's for sure. I, I was involved a little bit myself in the ITU Global Cyber Index when that was first launched. And I, I'm remembering vaguely their effort to kind of crowdsource that basically, to kind of send out <laughs> these, these spreadsheets where experts could help kind of rank how much you know relative weight to give to various dimensions along these lines. And I'm, I'm just, just wondering offhand, did you guys, um, as you were developing this methodology, have a, a, a little bit of a similar approach? Were you kind of canvassing opinions or were you trying mostly to look to see what had been done before, right? And see any obvious, you know, changes, maybe uh, blind spots as you kind of pointed out here and take those on, knowing that it's an iterative process, right? And there's always an opportunity to go back and try this again too. So is that mostly in-house or was it kind of a, a kind of a I big tent approach? Um, hmm. Simon then might, uh... Yeah, want, want, want to expand on that, but I think like a, really the, the idea or the core of the project was at first that these kind of measures that were out there were no like sufficient in, in a sense in showing uh, cyber power. So relying, uh, for instance, uh, on expert assessment, which is very important, but is, is not enough and there's a lot of bias that can come with that. So I think the uh, initial idea was also to really take a radical new approach <laughs> to the topic, uh, relying uh, in a first uh, iteration, let's say, like um, relying heavily on open source data uh, and considering expert assessments more as a validation tool. And there are always pros and cons with all of these methods uh, and approaches, but I think uh, really that, that allowed us at least to broaden up the spectrum. Um, and the ITU as far as, uh, as I'm familiar with it, uh, face these challenges of, of like uh, heavily kind of um, changes in the ranking due to, to this specific expert assessment. So mm -hmm. I kind of want, wanted to uh, avoid going down uh, this road. So, um, but maybe Simon has mm -hmm. additions mm -hmm. to that. Well, we, yeah, I mean, we were aware of the great work that others have done on this, you know, and, and doing the kind of expert led model is, yeah, is, is a great is a great way to focus. But we, yeah, we like the idea of trying to make you know bring that quantitative element to it. We thought was really mm -hmm. important. And yeah. you know, again, a lot of the a lot of it was about that bringing that focus. You know, assessing the objective and then making sure the the metric and indicator, uh, you know, mm -hmm. de demonstrated that that capability intent was really our, our kind of primary focus. Uh, yeah, and then I, I, I um, forgot to mention you in the report. We have also um, a graph kind of. Uh, mapping the, the two indexes together so uh, kind of reiterating a bit what Simon said is also kind of, we, we kind of wanted to expand and build up that doesn't mean that this measure can also be and should also be compared to each other uh, and maybe using conjunction mm -hmm. with each other so mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah, and that's on page page eight for those uh, keeping track, which is, yeah, it's very helpful to see that side by side and, and telling <laughs> and interesting, right? Because as you said, you know, kind of measuring um, different elements of, uh, of cybersecurity here and there, but I love it. I mean, Netherlands, number five, fantastic. I'm wondering, as you guys were going through this process, were there any real surprises that cropped up for you? Israel was on my list, so thank you for already, you know, <laughs> dealing with that, Anina. But were, were there others that you were either ranked much more highly or much more lowly than you expected kind of coming into this project, which is always part of the fun? I mean, I, um, I, I think because we were trying to be so kind of novel, you know, and again, again that, that brings risks and opportunity. I wouldn't say there's any, nothing felt, Nothing felt kind of too out of bounds. You know, we knew people yeah. comment on Israel. You know, the, the Dutch have been interested in um, their score. Um, the Australians have used it, you know, it's become a kind of policy debate in Australia a little bit around, you know, intent versus capability and mm -hmm. what the current administration is doing on cyber terms. So that that was there. We were aware, you know, as, as we are, there are a lot of Brits in this, you know, the British do tend to score very highly in intent terms and mm -hmm. fairly well up the rankings. You know, again, we, we feel we played it pretty straight with this, but you know, we were, um, you know, that, that was some, that was something that certainly attracted a little bit of attention, but mm -hmm. nothing kind of so out of the bounds. I mean, Israel, Israel is, is the, the one that again has kind of raised a little bit of policy debate, but, but in intent terms, you know, Israel is actually relatively high and, you know, and either otherwise pulled out mm -hmm. some good stats on where Israel scores. So. No, thank you. And we're running short on time. So just a reminder for last questions, feel free to submit those. Um, one that just came in was you mentioned that uh, you use publicly available data to generate um, the cyber power index. Any concerns that, here you go, was there any propaganda? Because, um, you know, perhaps even the cybersecurity strategies did themselves, since they're just, you know, high level strategic documents, right? They're not necessarily um, domestic policy, or even, I'm not sure, but the uh, this anonymous attendee could be referring to um, other types of, you know, information that could have been, you know, used to skew any of the data. Did you guys have any, I'm sure you did, uh, safeguards to ensure, you know, accuracy along the way? So, I mean, what we were looking for when we were doing that assessment of intent was, you know, what is a country trying to say, you know, to its national population, to, you know, to the international community? And so, you know, arguably, it was more a question of what people were not saying in the cyber realm. You know, we know that, for example, Russia was slightly kind of, you know, the language it tends to use about how it describes its offensive capability and its kind of destructive capability is not the same as Western countries tend, tend to focus on. Um, so, you know, it was more a case question of countries being kind of elusive in what they were saying. But again, you know, when we were measuring intent, we used both the textual analysis. We then also use things like, you know, participation in military exercises. Well, that is a good sign you're going for destructive capability if you're practicing, you know, turning off someone's power grid. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, we used attributed attacks as both, you know, a metric of intent. You know, if you've demonstrated your intent to the point you've actually pulled the trigger, you are definitely pursuing an, an objective. So we really feel across the course of the different indicators we gathered, that helped to bring, you know, an, an element of kind of consistency and clarity. No, yeah, right. and we have also yeah. had, um, you know, already rounds of discussion with experts in assessing our measure and kind of collecting also feedback on what uh, we might have omitted and so. So kind of we are uh, have validated it uh, already and are continuing to do so with also this. Uh, tool, uh, which is kind of, I think, very important for this type of work. Uh, no, excellent. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're pretty much out of time, but I want to make sure to get to Hal's question. Um, and then so maybe we'll do like a very, very short lightning round here. So Hal in particular was asking about the different kind of foreign policy strategies and approaches, particularly from the US and China in this way, um, with China being a little more focused on, um, you know, bending the curve to its long term strategic um, advantage. And he was wondering, uh, are these two foreign policy styles and approaches reflected in your rankings? You mentioned cyber norms, for example, perhaps they're um, reflected there to an extent. Yeah, I mean, that, that was an active area of competition. You know, we saw the information space as a key area, you know, Russia, China, US were, I think, respectively one, two and three in their, in their intent in that space. So mm -hmm. that will continue mm -hmm. to be a kind of domain of, of competition. But you know, it, it shows opportunities where countries can perhaps challenge, you know, surveillance was a high priority for 
Russia and China. Well, if the US and Western powers you know, want to compete in cyberspace, perhaps you know, encourage firms not to sell surveillance technology to, you know, to these countries. So, so it offers a good way to kind of you know, approach in a more in a more I think that we, we might have lost you again, Simon. I'm so sorry. <laughs> There was another question, if not, uh, I think in, in the chat box. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, they, who is the target sure. customer of, for this report? Mm -hmm. I, I might kind of just jump, up, jump in on that. Sure, or Simon, are you back? Ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Simon, uh, are you, you were, we lost you. I've been there. I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, basically, right. uh, I mean, Simon has already kind of uh, addressed this, uh, I think in, in kind of his final report a bit. Uh, so um, mm -hmm. we 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 have uh, multiple audiences hopefully for, for this. So if, uh, obviously the mm -hmm. the governments themselves uh, and the uh, uh, cyber experts that are interested mm -hmm. in that and kind of wanna we want to provide them a tool and also kind of continue continue to do this work uh, so that this can be more monitored and assessed in the future as well. Uh, but eventually also we want to. Um, Kind of broaden the discussion in academia as well that had a, a very narrow focus on on uh, cyber power uh, for now so kind of we want to provide at least like the first step uh, in broadening that hoping that kind of uh, this will uh, also um, invigorate the discussion there and maybe result and uh, result in a broader understanding of this concept and i think this is yeah i hope this this work was useful also for that part um so different audiences <laughs> absolutely and no very very much so and and very very last kind of quick final thought any plans for an update in a year or two is this going to be an ongoing uh process or was, are you guys approaching this as a kind of a one-off exercise for the time being uh okay um it's uh no we are we are definitely uh considering to continue with that so like considering to kind of move on to the next round of data collection so what uh, and, and maybe this is also you know we are kind of this is a open process and we want to you are very keen to discuss this so uh, if uh, anybody has like ideas also on on data specifically which i think the framework is in place so we will want to keep that uh, but mm -hmm. like uh, obviously mm -hmm. the index is as good as the data we can collect for it so if you have any mm -hmm. idea on kind of other or better data uh, once you may maybe have, a, have had a look at it. So we, we very welcome any kind of suggestions uh, on that part. I might just also, I don't know if uh, our emails are already shared, but I can, can quickly do that. Oh, sure. No, that'd be great if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Well, I'm glad to hear it because <laughs> I think it'd be, it'd, it'd be great to continue this. Um, and uh, I'm so glad you guys are focusing on the cybersecurity strategies. They're, they're such useful documents, and I don't feel like they get the play they deserve. We're doing something similar now with AI um, national you know, strategies, which has been kind of an interesting <laughs> um, exercise anyway. So um, thank you so much. I know we're unfortunately a few minutes over time already, uh, but I really, really appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedules to highlight this important work. And um, thanks again to everybody for joining. And one last virtual round of applause for both Anina and Simon. <laughs> Much appreciated, Thank guys. Thanks for having us. Thank thanks you. again. Be safe. Have a wonderful rest of your days. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>